There's a story, and it's a story of Lazarus, and in Lazarus' life, remember that Jesus loved, loved him and loved his family, and as he was coming to, to Lazarus' home, they had told him that Lazarus was sick, and yet he said, I'm going to wait, I'm going to wait a few more, a, a, a few more days. And when Lazarus arrived, um, when Jesus arrived at Lazarus' home, he was dead. And immediately, of course, Martha and Mary, the sisters, are coming up to him, and they're coming up and saying, God, if you, if you would have been here, he, 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 he wouldn't have died. But even now, God, you know, you know, is there something? And Jesus gives this revelation to her and says, I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me, even though he dies, you know, he's going to live and he who's alive will not die. It's, it's pretty supernatural because basically what Jesus is telling them is that there's something in your life that's going to be transformed by his presence. And he comes into their life and they see Lazarus dead. And what Lazarus is going to be a, a great testimony because what's going to happen in Lazarus's life, we all know he's going to, he's going to be raised from the dead. But as they come to him, Mary comes and sees Jesus, and as soon as she sees Jesus and begins to speak to him, she begins to weep, and Jesus weeps also. And he begins to cry with her because he knows how she's feeling. He knows he's already prayed. He's already moving in faith, knowing that Lazarus is going to come alive. But he sees the hurt and the pain that death causes and separation causes. And so he's coming alongside her and knowing that. And it says that once again, deeply moved, he comes to the tomb. And he says, I, you know, remove that rock. Lazarus is going to come out. And they're going, wait a minute, Lord. You know, he's been dead four days. His body is, it, it smells. It's, it's done. It's done. And that was kind of a revelation as I was looking at that. And we can come into a lot of deep revelations as you look at the story of Lazarus. But what Jesus says is he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And so not only was Lazarus going to be healed, not only was his body and his life going to be called back into his body, because we saw that. We saw that Jesus would go and there would be a woman whose son had died and he had compassion on that woman and he touched the coffin and that son came back to life. And we're going to look at another story where there's going to be a young man and, and Elijah's going to pray for him and he's going to come back to life. And there's all these stories in the Bible where people had died and yet when somebody stepped out of the natural and stepped into the supernatural, they began to see the, the nature of God that would flood into their life and change the, the atmosphere where they were. And so now Jesus is coming in Lazarus' body. You may not have ever thought about this, but it's already decaying. It had to have been decaying. And so what Jesus was really, I think part of what he was showing, is he's saying, not only am I the Lord who... Uh, calls the dead back to life, but I am the resurrection and the life. That that was decayed and dead is coming back together. You may be a dust in the ground, but 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 the word tells us that one day we will be resurrected and our bodies will be resurrected. And yes, it won't be the same type of body we have now, but it's going to be a spiritual body much better but our body's going to be resurrected from the dead. And right now you're seeing resurrection power come into Lazarus' life. And Jesus calls to Lazarus and says, listen, if you will believe, you will see the glory of God. And that was kind of an if on that. And see, that's a lot of times we think, well, if it's God's will, it's going to happen. And God's waiting for somebody to say, if you will believe, then you're going to see the glory of God. And so what God's asking you to, 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 to know is he wants you to know his character and who he is. And Jesus reveals that God's character is that he is the resurrection and he is your life. And so they call Lazarus and he calls in a loud voice and he says, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus rises up bound with grave clothes. And maybe he's, I don't know how he's coming out, but he's, standing and trying to make his way out and Jesus tells him remove the grave clothes from him and so Lazarus is an example of the character of God that he's saying if you will know who I am then something's going to transform in your life so what the Holy Spirit was really placing on my heart today is that a lot of times we think that God 
is we pray and we're praying that God's going to intervene. And with this intervention, he's going to perform a miracle or he's going to give us an answer to, uh, to a financial need or he's going to save a loved one. And yet what God's trying to show us, he's saying it's not the intervention that is the character of God. God is healing. He is provision. He is your resurrection and your life. And so what he's trying to do is get us to come into a spiritual dimension where we begin to see who he is. It isn't that I'm asking God uh, to, to, to heal this child that's sick, but what I'm trying to do is get into the presence of God where God's presence begins to envelop me. And then because he's enveloped my life and he's given us dominion and authority on the earth, we declare who he is in the name of Jesus. And we see his nature begin to transform life around us. So this is why God then takes a word and he tells us in 2 Corinthians and chapter 10 and verse three and four, we start out, he says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So a stronghold is a place fortified against attack. A stronghold, when somebody is going into a stronghold, they have already fortified that position so that the attack will not come and not overcome it. So this is an important character because what God's trying to say is, who is your stronghold? And we can go into his presence and it's been fortified because I've put on the full armor of God and I know the character of God and I know the nature of God. And so I know that, 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 that I can stand in that stronghold. But the enemy has a stronghold as well. And so this is the way the enemy works. Remember, he's a liar. He, everything he speaks is contrary to the word of God, contrary to the character of God. He wants you to believe something that is not true. And he brings in a partial truth and then he corrupts it so that you can think, oh yeah, that's true. And yet you got to say, no, God, I got to know your character. I got to know your nature. I got to know who you are. And so for though we live in the world, we don't wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, we have divine power to demolish strongholds. So the word demolish is to completely obliterate it. It's not just to, not just to, to, to defeat the enemy, but to destroy it where there's nothing left. It is pulverized. It is gone. There's nothing left to be rebuilt. And so God is saying, I want to bring something into your life that is going to completely demolish the lie of the enemy. And so he goes on and he declares this word in 2 Corinthians uh, 10 and verse 5. He says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We take captive every thought and we make it obedient to Christ. So what are some of the arguments that come into our life? Well, there's a lot, but we'll see that with Mary and Martha, they're going, if you would have just been here, this would have happened, right? But Jesus was trying to show, I am the resurrection and the life, that death has no power over your life. And in fact, Jesus would go to the cross within days and they would crucify him and they would put him in the grave and he would be in the tomb for three days. And because he had already manifested to them and shared with them a truth, he said, I'm the resurrection and the life. Then he was going to raise from the dead and they wouldn't believe it when they saw it. And the angels would come and they would tell them, look, Jesus has been resurrected. And they would, they, th their mind would, would have a hard time believing it. But because they heard the word, they had to take captive the lies that said, no, Jesus is dead. He's gone. It's never going to happen. Or they're going to take the truth that says, no, he is the resurrection and the life. And every word he has spoken shall come to pass. So in our life, God's saying, if you're going to know me, then you got to know my character so that when the counterfeit comes in and wants you to compromise, you're going to take every thought captive and you're going to go, wait a minute, who is Jesus? You got to agree with who Jesus is. 
And if Jesus came, everybody that came to Jesus, he didn't turn one person away. It's amazing. That it's, not, it's not recorded. He didn't turn one person away that came to him. Yeah, there was an instance, and you might think of an instance where this woman was, had a, a, a daughter who was, we could say, mentally ill, but she was, in this case, she was demonized. And she came to Jesus, and Jesus says, I've come to give the bread to the children, and i got to give, basically, I've come to share with Israel. I've come to come into the kingdom of God, and that was a Samaritan. And said, so that's not the time. Maybe a different, different, uh, a different time, but he's saying, what did she do? She began to come to Jesus in faith and said, yes, but even the children's bread, even the crumbs are given to the dogs. And so she's saying, you know what? Maybe I'm not worthy, but there is a grace that comes because of the blessing that comes to the children. And I believe that blessing is mine today. And Jesus said, okay, because of your faith that's done for you today. So her faith was not stopped by circumstances but she said, I know God is compassionate. I know he is powerful. I know he is merciful. And yeah, there may be circumstances that are, that, that are keeping me. And even Jesus said, it's not the time. She says, no, but I'm asking you now, God. And something transformed in her life. And so when we see the word of God, we've got to decide that God's word is true. And that every argument that comes against his word, that I'm going to take that captive and I'm going to make it obedient to Christ. So what's an argument? An argument, uh, we could say, well, you won that argument. Well, you're presenting uh, a facts for your case. But often an argument is false reasoning. And they come, an uh, argument can be words of strife. We know that. But an argument also means to wrangle with words. What's a wrangler? He like ties up that, that calf puts a rope around them so they can't keep walking. So because I brought in a word and a thought that is contrary to the word of God, now you're not sure what God's word is. And God say, no, I want you to know my word and to come into that place where that revelation is going to fill your life. And in your life, see, there's going to be revelation in our life, but we have to get the foundation of who Jesus is before we go into even the deeper things of God. So I got to know the foundations and the things of God. And somebody was saying that if you had a, if you had somebody building a home and you said, Hey, you know what? The painter's going to come. And when the painter comes, it's going to be beautiful. Uh, yeah, but the walls aren't up yet. And so if the painter begins to do his job before the walls are up, what's going to happen? You're going to spray and you're going to go, Whoa, look at the beautiful colors. It's going to be gone and it's gone. And so what God's trying to say is I want to get a foundation in your life so that when you hear the promise of God, there is something that it will be attached to and it will be something beautiful because you're going to say, you know what? What God has created is solid. It is firm. It will never be shaken. His word is true. And now that he has brought this added benefit to my life, now I can see something that transforms me because I've seen, I've seen a picture that I didn't see before. I saw a building that I did not see before. I saw, I saw something manifest that I didn't understand before because now I've got the word of God in my life. So what God's saying is I want you to get my word in your life so that it will, it will demolish every argument of the enemy. And so what, is, what do we do? We got to get the word of God and we got to go, this is what God said. So they came in to, they were coming into the promised land and they were used to uh, seeing the power of God come in and they're seeing the power of God, but they hadn't been in the presence of God. And so it's like they're seeing, they're seeing maybe a, a part of that building go up, but they're not seeing the foundation that had to go behind it. And so once they're coming into a new, a new test in their life, they don't have the foundation. And so now we're seeing that they're coming into the promised land again. And, and what's happening is that they're going to come in and God's going to say, I've given you this land. It's flown with milk and honey. And when they begin to see the obstacles that have come against them, they're going to say, we can't do it. The obstacles are too great. It's too impossible. We can't do it. And yet God said, I'm giving this to you. And so Joshua and Caleb begin to take that argument captive and say, no, we can surely do it if God is for us. 
But everybody began to grumble and they began to moan and they began to make excuses why they couldn't do it and why God was bringing them to a place where their families were going to die. And so, in fact, uh, they opened themselves up to the curse and their families, everyone that was over 20, died in the desert. Except for Caleb and Joshua. And so the word declares, take every argument and every pretension. What's a pretension? It pretends, it's make-believe, it's an act, it's a sham, it's a faking, it's a falsification, it's an invention, it's an imagination, it's self-deception. So it's saying take every argument and every pretender, instead of pretension, what's a, you know what a pretender is, he pretends to be something that it's not. The enemy comes in and pretends that this is the word of God and you got to decide, no, this is what the scripture says. So I'm going to stand on what God says. As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. And I'm not going to back up and I'm not going to stop believing and I'm not going to stop standing till I see my family serving God with all their heart, mind, soul and strength in the name of Jesus. So how do we take every thought captive? Well, we know this in Matthew 6, 9. This is what God says. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. The way we take every thought captive, remember, is not by having an intervention of God to bring a healing into our life or a miracle into our life or a word into our life. But what we want to do is get into the presence of God and we see that it is the character of God and the nature of God. He is our healer. He is our miracle worker. He is our peace. He is our comforter. He is our shepherd. He is the Lord, our provider. And so when you begin to pray that I have a relationship with my father and that his name is holy and that his character is awesome, then I begin to build a foundation in my life that stands against the enemy that says, God's not going to heal you. God's not going to move on your behalf. God's not going to work for you. And I'm going to go, oh, I can tell you this. Yes, he, he does perform instantaneous miracles, but what I want is the character of God in my life so that wherever I walk, I'm going to take every thought cast Captive and make it obedient to Christ. Daniel 6, 5. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis or charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. And I'm sharing this story because Daniel was the man who has shown you how he takes every thought captive. Because what's happening in Daniel's life is Daniel has gone from king to king to king. The nation has been lost. Israel has been overcome by Babylon. Babylon has been overcome. And now we're coming into different nations and Daniel's still in a place of authority. And so when we pick up the story and we're looking at the story of Daniel in the lion's den, and that's kind of what this is dealing with, uh, scholars tell us that he's over 90 years old. And Daniel's over 90 years old. He's not sitting back, but he's still in a position of prominence. Because when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, a 90-year-old man, you think, hey, he's not getting out of there. The lion's mouth was shut. And Daniel's going to come out of the lion's den. And the king is going to go. And because the king had made this edict that, that could not be changed, Daniel was going to be thrown in the lion's den because the king was going to make an edict that if anybody prays to any other god except for the king, he's going to be thrown in. So they had tried to trap Daniel. And so when he's thrown in, the king has a relationship with him. And he's saying, Daniel, did your God, was he able to rescue you? Daniel had shared who his God was with the king and with everyone around him. They didn't wonder who his God was. They didn't wonder what the power of his God was. They didn't wonder what Daniel's faith was all about. The king knew who his faith was about. And so when Daniel comes in, he's showing you that he is a man who has taken every thought captive and made it obedient to Christ. 
And yet, did he know Christ? He's looking forward to that. And that's what we see, that the, all the prophets look forward to what would be done and what was prophesied. So he's looking forward to that. And we know that when Christ died, that he was the lamb that was slain from the foundations of the earth. And so we know that all humanity is covered by the blood of Jesus and by that that was done on the cross. And so now Daniel's coming and we'll just read the story. Finally, these men said, we'll never find any basis or charges against this man, Daniel, unless it's something to do with the law of his God. And so they issued a decree in verse 7, issue a decree in edict and enforce a decree that anyone who prays to any God or man during the next 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be thrown into the lion's den. In verse 10 of Daniel 6, now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went upstairs he went to his upstairs room where the windows were open toward Jerusalem. And three times a day he got on his knees and he prayed, giving thanks to God just as he had done before. And so three times a day Daniel would pray. Three times a day he would move out of the normal, uh, the normal complexities of his life and he would move into a presence of God and into a place where he was a worshiper of God. Three times a day, he would say, I'm going to get in to the presence of God and I'm going to worship God for who he is. And I want to know the character of God. He is the Lord, my shepherd, and I shall not want. He is the Lord, my peace. He is my shalom where there is nothing missing and nothing broken in my life. He is the Lord, my righteousness. He is the Lord, my healer. He is my shield and my very great reward. And so in Daniel's life, you got to think, what would you do if, a, if you knew an edict had been made not to pray? What would you do? Would you say, hey, you know what? Maybe God, you're okay if I close the windows today. I don't want to offend anybody else because they don't, they don't believe in the same God I do, and so I don't want to offend them. Or are you going to say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe. And so Daniel doesn't change the course of his life because of an edict that's made, and the enemy's trying to trap him, and he's trying to say, you're going to worry. You don't need to pray that way. You can pray in your secret place of prayer. Nobody needs to see you. I can start changing all the scriptures to make an excuse why my life's going to change, but I'm going to tell you what. Daniel had already been an example of somebody who loved God. And so for him to change now, would have been for the world around him to say, see, he bowed his knee and he compromised. And so Daniel had to make a choice. He said, this isn't something new that I'm doing. I've got to continue to be the person that everybody around me knows that I am. He's not starting out to be a witness now and say, oh, look, everybody, I'm not going to obey the king and be some radical. He's saying, you already know that I worship my God. You already know that I am uh, compassionate. You already know that I am kind. You already know that I am fair. You already know that, that, that there is no corruption, that you're not going to be able to, to catch me because of some corrupt deal that I made to gain money and finances. And Daniel says, I'm not going to hide now because I'm going to take the thought captive that says compromise, you make it through, and God change these men, get them out of office. And Daniel's going, yeah, change them and get them out of office, but I'm not compromising God because you are my high tower and you are my strength. Now Daniel had learned that the decree had been published. He went home to his upstairs room where his window was open toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God just as he had done before. And these men went in as a group and they found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So when he was praying, he, I believe, he's saying, you know, Jesus has given us the example, but we're declaring who God is and we're saying, God, I need help right now. I need you to help me. I don't know what to do, but I am going to stand and I am going to pray and I am not going to compromise. In Psalm 144, 2, it says, He is my loving God and my fortress. He is my loving God and my fortress. 
So what do you say in a time of trouble? You don't go, oh man, look at this trouble. No, I want to get into the presence of God where His character begins to shape my life. So that now when I see a storm coming up and the storm's overcoming in the boat, I don't wonder whether God wants me to make it to the other side. But I go, you know what? God said He's going to satisfy me with a long life. And He's given me a, a, a call on my life to share the gospel. And, he, and, and right now is not the end of my life. So maybe I can wake up Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, what do we do? What do we do? Uh, you, you're able, should we keep rowing? Should we start praying? Should we start bailing? Should we throw somebody overboard? <laughs> Lighten the load? What do we do? But instead of moving in fear, you're coming, no, we're going to come in faith. And Jesus said, hey, this is what you're going to do. You're going to speak to the wind and the waves, and you're going to command them to be still and to be calm. And Jesus stands and he rebukes them because of their little faith. Because he said, we're going to drown. They weren't speaking their destiny. They weren't asking, how am I going to get into my destiny? But they were overcome by the environment around them and said, my destiny's done. And God wants to change that. And he wants to come in and change us so that he's saying, you know what? He is the God who loves me. He is my loving God and my fortress my stronghold, my deliverer, my shield, and whom I take refuge, who subdues people under me. This is the promise of God. I love you. I am your fortress. I am your stronghold. You are my deliverer. You are my shield. You are my refuge. You subdue people under. I am an overcomer because you are with me. And in Proverbs 21, 22, listen to what it says about this. And this is not even a, 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 this is how a wise man, it says a wise man attacks a city of the mighty and that should say, and pulls down the strongholds in which they trust. The word also says, and I didn't put the scripture in you, it says that there are men who put their trust in wealth. And so when trouble comes, they get disappointed. And Daniel's not trusting in wealth to bribe those that made an edict against him and figure out how he could pay off the judges. But he's going, my God is my fortress. He is my shield. He is my strength. I am a man who lives under the principles of God. I'm a man of integrity. And God will protect me and he will guide me. And even if the judgment comes against me, it is God who will determine the outcome. And the lion's mouths are shut. And Daniel overcomes. Ephesians 4.25, it says this about strongholds too. It says, therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the, the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold or a stronghold. So if you're going to be angry and not forgive during the day, the word is saying what you've done is you've allowed the enemy to have a stronghold to come in your life. If you're going to believe that God was not for you and, that, and you become angry with God, then you give a stronghold to the enemy. If you believe that somebody, maybe it's just somebody innocently, they cut you off on traffic or your wife or your husband or the, somebody else at work and you become angry and you don't take that to God, say, God, I'm not sure why they acted that way, but God, they're going through something tough and I pray for them to be saved. I don't want the enemy to get a stronghold in my life. And that's what the enemy does. He gets a stronghold and he gets a hurt and he gets something that's contrary to the image of God. And he says, aha, because you held on to this, I'm going to hold on to this in your life now. And I'm going to cause this hurt to continue in your life. And I got to go to God and say, God, forgive me and forgive those who have sinned against me. In Mark 3, 27 and 28, it says, In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house and carry off his possession unless he first ties up the strong man, then he can rob his house. I tell you the truth, all sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven. Okay, Jesus, a lot of times when we look at this, they had just told Jesus that he was demonized. And how when he was bringing deliverance, it's because he was Beelzebub, he was the, the king of the demons. 
And Jesus gives this example, and he talks about how a house divided will not stand, how a nation divided will not move. And so how, the enemy is not going to be working against himself. And he's trying to give them this example, but a lot of times we read this and we'll see a strong man's house and we'll say, well, then he's going to tie him up and he's carry off his possessions. Sometimes we'll think about somebody who has been taken captive by the enemy and how we need to bind that strong man so that we can take back and redeem what the enemy has stolen. But part of it, as I was looking at this, and maybe you can take it this way if you'd like. It says, no one can enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man and then he can rob his house. Christians might be that strong man. But if your faith is in your own abilities, in your own strength, if it's in, if it's in, the, if it's in finances, if it's in uh, your financial advisor, if it's in the government, if it, what's your source that becomes your stronghold? That's where I can go and that'll be my protection. And so what, the, what it's saying here is that what the enemy does is he will come and he will bind up everything you have thought was your protection. And then he will steal from your life. And so you've got to have your protection be God. He has to be your strong tower. The character of God and the nature of God has to flood your life so that when the enemy comes in and he says, look at what I'm going to steal from you. You go, you can't steal because that, that wasn't my strength. My strength is God. He is my provider. He is my source. He is my healer. He is my shepherd and he is my peace. So I've got to stand and I've got to declare that he is my God and my king. And Elijah had just spoken a prophetic word from God and, and there was going to be no rain in the season. We see that in James that he spoke the word and at his word he was a man that prayed earnestly just like us and it stopped raining. And it says, uh, the word of God came and says, you will drink from the brook. I have ordered ravens to feed you there. I love this story. I love this story. God is ordering ravens to feed Elijah. The king and Jezebel are going to look for him to take his life. But now God's saying, I'm going to put you in this place. This is just a season in your life, but I'm going to provide for you right here. And so the word says, the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. I've always read, you know, when I first, I'll just share with you again. You know, you've heard me share this before, but when I read that, I thought, well, they're bringing him little mice and stuff and I was like oh man I gotta grill that little mouse or a little lizard but then I read the word and said wait a minute he brought him bread where did he get bread from so if he's bringing him bread he might as well bring him a steak some maybe some shrimp tacos <laughs> I don't know what he's bringing him but he's not just he's bringing him something that's a source and sustainment and and the ravens are obeying God could we obey God the ravens are not saying, no, nah, I need that food to eat. Ah, I can't do it. No, they're going, no, no, God said do this. And the ravens are bringing him food. That's amazing. That's an amazing miracle. And in verse 7, it says, sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came to him, go at once to Zarephath and Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. Okay. The brook's drying up. Sometimes you're going to see the place you're at as your source, and God's going, no, I'm your source. I'm your provider. Sometimes you might see one business as your source, and God's going, no, I'm your source. I'm your provider. I will meet your needs. I will cause you to know good things in your life, right? And so it dries up, and I believe that the reason that brook's drying up is because maybe they had done their search house to house, and they couldn't find them, and they had searched everywhere, and they couldn't find them. And so now as the time's gone by, now they've given up searching in homes. So he says, okay, now you can move in to a position that's more comfortable, but I'm also going to change somebody's life because I want to bless them. And Jesus used this woman's life because he says, weren't there many that were hungry in Israel, and yet the prophet wasn't sent to any of them? 
It was sent to one woman who was seeking a transformation in her life and said, God, I will be obedient to you. I will believe your word. I will take every thought captive, every situation that comes in my life, and I will declare that your word is true. And so God says he's commanded this widow to supply him with food. That's amazing to me. I want to be used by God. I want to be generous. But the time came in her life where she was on her last meal. And it says this in verse 10. So he went to Zarephath and he came to the town gate and a widow was there gathering sticks and he called her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I can have a drink? And as she was going to get it, he called and said, and bring me please a little piece of bread. And I believe her nature was probably, God, I've been praying to help the prophet, but now I can't do it. So the word came into her mind. This, see, the word that was contrary to the commandment of God is that you're his source, you're his supplier. And God's going, no, I am his source and I will supply you so that you can bring an anointing into this person's life. And as you give, then we're seeing that what Elijah is saying is bring me a little piece of bread. and a little. He's saying, bring in the tithe. Bring me just a little portion of what you have left. You have one little meal left. Just bring me 10% of that. You have one meal for two people. Just bring me 10%, not even a third. Just bring me a little portion first because God's saying, I need you to have your heart after God. And I need you to know that you're not living by, by this meal, but that God is your source and he's your provider. Verse 12, as surely as the Lord God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take it home and to make a meal for myself and for my son that we may eat it and die. So in her mind, the word that is coming contrary to the word of God is it's too late. I could have helped the prophet earlier. I had some finances, but now they've dried up. I don't have any way to help. And God's going, what do you have right now? Because when you thought you couldn't do it, when you thought you couldn't help, then God's saying, that's the time I'm going to use your life. When you thought you were too old or you weren't smart enough or you weren't strong enough, God's going, now you're in that shape where now you're my servant. Now you're saying that I'm going to do it in your life. And Elijah declares in verse 13, Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Don't let fear, don't let the thoughts of fear run in your mind. Don't entertain the thoughts of fear. He's saying, don't entertain that word that is contrary to the nature of God and the promises of God. He said, go home and do as you have said. He's saying, yeah, go ahead and make your last meal. Go ahead and have sustenance for yourself. That's okay. But first, Make a small cake of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain on the land. And so a prophetic word comes to say, you got to take that thought captive because God is saying, I'm going to meet your needs. You're not going to run out of flour. You're not going to run out of oil. You're going to be sustained until the land begins to produce again. And you can see income come into your life and you can see provision come into your life through, through the natural order. So he said, I'm going to bring a miracle into your life. Amen. And so she went away and did, in verse 15, she went away and did as Elijah had told her. And so there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Somebody had to know the nature and character of the word of God and speak a word that was contrary to the natural order of events. In the natural order, she was going to die and wasn't going to make it. But there was a word that came with the character of God and the command of God and the provision of God and said, if you'll trust me and you'll put me first in your life and see that this is not your source, but I am your source, then I'm going to do a miracle for you. And the oil did not run out, and the jug of oil did not run out, and the flour did not run out. Thank you, Jesus. 
And what happens to her in 1 Kings 17, as we go down the very next verse, it says, Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill, and he grew worse and worse, and he finally stopped breathing. And so she said to Elijah, What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin, my sin and kill my son? So what does the word come? There is a narrative that is contrary to the promise of God that says, see, there's sin in your life. You're a sinner. You deserve to die. Your child deserves to die. You don't deserve anything good. And so the narrative is the enemy is coming to fill you with a thought that is contrary to the word of God. It is an argument that tells you that God is not for you. And Elijah is going to come and say, you got to take that thought captive. We got to make it obedient to the word of God. We got to declare what God says. We can't entertain that and run it over in our mind and figure out why God's not going to do it. We got to find out who God is and then begin to declare who God is and be transformed by the renewing of my mind because then I'm going to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I got to know the will of God and the character of God so that I can run to that strong tower. And so Elijah says, give me your son in verse 19. And Elijah replied, he took him from her arms and he carried him to an upper room where he was staying and he laid him on the bed. And we know that there's an anointing there. We know um, the dead are going to rise from his bones even later on. And so there's an anointing on his life. And so he's going in and he's saying, give me your son. So she has to give him the son. The son has died. He's already dead. But he says, won't you, let's go. Let's pray right now. And then he cried out to the Lord. Oh, Lord, my God, have you brought tragedy upon this widow I'm staying with by causing her son to die? So he's asking a question. God, was this your will? But then the narrative changes and you'll see his prayer changes. And then he stretched himself out on the boy three times. You got to take every thought captive. If you're going to believe that it's God who brought the tragedy, then why bother praying? If you're going to believe that it was God's timing for this boy to go, then why bother praying? But he puts that captive and he goes in and says, you know what? You're a God of miracles. This lady heard your word. This lady has been used by you, God, because her heart was right. And you called her to be able to bring provision into my life and open up her home to me. And so I'm asking you, God, for a miracle for her right now. And then he cried out to God. And he said, in verse 21, then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and he cried to the Lord, O oh Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. O oh Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. And it didn't happen. And he stretched out again. O oh Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. And it didn't happen. And he prayed again. Lord, let this boy's life return. And he came back to life. And it says the Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him. And he lived. And he picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. And he gave him to his mother and said, look, your son's alive. If the, if the child had died, I'm just thinking, if the child had died, yeah, we could still glorify God. We could still live for God. We could still say, you know what? I'm not going to turn my back on God. If Daniel had gone to the lion's den and been eaten by lions in there, what a great story that would have been. This great man of God didn't deny God and he went even to the lion's den. If Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had been burned up in the furnace, what a great story. They were martyrs for God. They didn't deny Christ. Man, that, it would still preach good. But that's not what happened. The presence of God and the character of God and the nature of God intervened in their life. And there was something that was not natural. It was supernatural because we serve a God who is able to do that that is impossible with man. It is possible with God. 
And so Daniel goes into the lion's den at 90 years old, and he says, I'm not compromising, and I'm going to keep praying, and I'm asking you to help me, God. And God sends an angel, and he shuts the mouths of the lions. And Mary and Martha are there, and they're crying, and they're saying, oh, Jesus, if you had just been here, you're the healer. And Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. Do you know my character? Do you know who I am? He says, if you'll step out in faith and remove the stone. Ah, he smells. If you'll do it, you're going to see the glory of God. And he prays and says, Father, thank you for hearing me. And Jesus corrects everybody. He says, I didn't say this because I need to pray again. I'm saying this so that everybody can know that God has done this as an answer to prayer. And he calls Lazarus out. See, sometimes in our life, we're looking for that nature of God. We need to get in prayer. We need to hear the heart of God. We need to hear the character of God so that we go into the situation. We're not wondering, is this your will or not your will, God? But we're saying, you know what? God is a resurrection and the life. So Lazarus, you got to come out. And that's what Elijah did with this boy. God, is this, did you do this? And then something in his mind changes. He says, no, 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 no. Let his life return. And it happened. I got to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Whether I'm praying for my marriage, whether I'm praying for my children, whether I'm praying for my country, whether I'm praying for my finances, my job, my income, whatever I'm praying for, and say, you know what, God? You're my source. Transform my marriage. Transform my children. Transform my country. May your character and nature flood my life and everything I put my hand to. We have divine power to demolish strongholds, to take every thought captive, and to make it obey Christ. Every thought that was contrary to the promise of God, you're a liar. I'm not going to entertain you. God, Jesus, your word is true, and I'm going to worship you and praise you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Let's stand, let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. For it is, uh, yeah, for it is not the intervention of God you have been seeking, saith the Lord. It is not just an event to change, but it is my presence, saith the Lord. And if you will come and you will pray and you will seek me with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength, Will I not come into your life and bring my presence into your life? And I will reveal my nature to you and I will reveal my word to you and I will reveal my character to you. And you will be transformed because you have come into my presence and you have heard my words and you have heard my promises. And you will be that building that is not just an outward appearance, but you have a foundation that will never fail for your life is built upon the rock. And because you were built upon the rock, you can come into my presence. And as you come into my presence, you will hear my heart. And as you hear my heart, I will fill your words that you can pray for those around you that are hopeless and without direction, and without a shepherd. And you can share my truth that they may know the great shepherd Jesus and they may hear his call and hear his voice and know a freedom that is possible no other way. So take every thought captive and make it obedient to the anointed one. Take every random thought and say, you're going to line up with Jesus.
because he is the lover of my soul. He is my healer. He is my provider and my strength. And so I pray for you right now in Jesus' name. May his anointing, may his presence fill your thoughts. May it fill your words. And may you demolish every stronghold of the enemy. And may the name of Jesus be exalted in every area of your life. In Jesus' name we pray.